Ladies and gentlemen, today we begin a very sober four-week investigative series that reveals the final warning left behind by the late Dr. Thomas R. Horn that now resides in what would become his very last book. And we begin right now. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Skywatch TV. Before we dive into today's program, I want to show you something that people have been waiting literally months to see. Watch this. In 2023, following one of the most legendary and prophetic ministerial careers the world has ever seen, my father, the late Dr. Thomas R. Horn, began what would become his final book. After collaborating with Defender Publishing's Ali Anderson and myself, he had just completed his master manuscript before his untimely passing in October of last year. During his final conversations, he was still emphasizing that this message had to get out, that it was of paramount importance that the world was made aware of what was coming. Society has absolutely no idea what they're embracing, what they've invited in, even welcomed it as the future savior of humanity. This will ultimately be the one thing that brings about our own demise. If humanity survives, it will unequivocally alter life as we know it. By the time people realize the danger that they've embraced, it will be too late. It will have become unstoppable. Updating social credit score, citizen 1934265. One final book. One final warning. The world is not ready for what is coming. Dr. Thomas R. Horn, Joe Artis Horn, Ali Anderson. Summoning the Demon, coming March 2024 from Defender Publishing. Artificial Intelligence and the Image of the Beast. Welcome back to Skywatch TV. I'm Joe Artis Horn. Today, before I mention the final warning, before I reveal the cover and I show you the final book, I want to introduce who's here in house today to help us champion this vital message that was left behind by the late Dr. Thomas R. Horn. Dear friends of our family, Derek and Sharon Gilbert, Allie Anderson, my beautiful mother, Nita Horn, my beautiful wife, Catherine Horn, and Donna Howell. For the first time, ladies and gentlemen, take a look at this book cover. Summoning the Demon, Artificial Intelligence and the Image of the Beast by Dr. Thomas R. Horn, myself, and Ali Anderson. This is going to be a very sober focus of discussion as it was the last body of work that my father completed before his untimely passing. I want to set this up properly right out of the gate because Ali, in the last months of his life, he was working on what would now reside in this book, but it felt very different to all of us that were in proxy to him. He was especially urgent about this message. He continued to say even before his health began to deteriorate very quickly in those final days that this message had to get out. We've talked many times as family about the revelations that he seemed to be receiving in those final months. He talked about God illuminating things very crystal clear to him. And Ali, as a contributing author to this book, I know that you spent a lot of time with our father, Dr. Thomas Horn, in those final months. Tell us how your participation kind of got worked into this body of work. As you know, Tom Horn, or I'm probably gonna forget sometimes during this and say dad. Just say dad. <laughs> He was always looking for ways that the uh, emergent technology 
uh, could it impact the direction that humanity is going? How right, do these right, right. weave in with end times events? This was a huge topic of interest to him. He was preaching about that back in the 70s and 80s. With this particular topic of interest, right. he was beginning to really see not only warning signs, but things that were currently happening that mean this could be already beginning, not about to start next year, not, you know, maybe in five years. It was like, this has already started. It's right. launched now. So something that he did was he went on and had a conversation with a chatbot and asked this chatbot, is AI going to take over the world? Is it going to destroy humanity? Is it going to play into the image of the beast system? And he was just expecting an answer like, does not compute. Let me jump in and help set this up for just a minute, because when you say chatbot, there might be those out there that aren't familiar at all with what you're referring to. But Tom was receiving a lot of emails, and of course he's a, a diligent researcher, so he's seeing the signs of the times, and he is seeing where artificial intelligence already is being used, where our governments are already utilizing it for our benefit, and how even people wielding cell phones now are interacting with this technology. So when you say a chat bot, mm -hmm. this is a software that's been developed so that we can interact with artificial intelligence, but as Dad was receiving, you know, volleys of emails from people that he knows on the inside as he's praying, as God is showing him how this technology is being used. He wanted to find out for himself how intelligent it could carry on a conversation. So he actually decided to do an interview with a chat bot and ask it some questions about its potential nefarious and prophetic perhaps goals or incentives. That's what started the premise behind this whole book. So he was expecting an answer like doesn't compute or here's the scripture about the beast that you're looking for. It's because he's asking deeply theological questions yeah. and he's expecting it to basically non-compute, right. do not understand. Right. So basically his conversation with this chatbot went like this. If AI were to become sentient and take over the world, maybe destroy humanity, maybe even become something that facilitated the beast system, sure. is this something that could happen? And this AI chatbot responded something that was nearly two pages or three pages long, double spaced. It was, it was a first paragraph basically saying, no, AI would not do that. AI would not take over the world or become the beast system. But if we did decide to do it, here's how it would happen. Right. And then it gave a seven right. point list of right. all the ways that it could actually happen if it ever decided to. Right. And so he brought this to me and asked me to start doing some research for him. We actually spent a lot of last summer working on this. And actually what started as a topic of interest became a very serious warning. Mm -hmm. And that is part of where this urgency came from. Right. Because, you know, some of his previous works he had warned about, you know, comets that are coming or asteroids that may come. This one's here. Right. Yeah. And so that became very urgent for him. Right. Yeah. My involvement with this book took place more towards the midway progression of this overall project. And you could say it was an accident or you could say that maybe the Holy Spirit gave me great revelation. And I ended up sharing this with my sister Donna Howell, who then shared it with my father, who, who was actually, to my surprise, blown away because who actually brings anything to Tom Horn that <laughs> surprises him, right? And especially not his son, right? I'm learning at the feet of the father. Do you understand what I'm saying? But I was on the set of Simply His, and the conversation started out, what are my concerns about the use of pornography in our young people and digital mm -hmm. devices? One thing led to the next, and I started to talk out loud and kind of sort out my concerns about where artificial intelligence is gonna take this to levels previous generations have never even thought about. And I started what I am now calling my three phases of the rollout of AI, which I hope to next week actually walk you through. But for the purposes of this first introductory program, I will just say that I shared this thought on the set of the Simply His Coffee Shop program. Donna Howell texted me later that evening and she said, I am completely blown away and I can't get what you said out of my head. And I said, well, Run it past dad, see if he likes it. Maybe it would want to belong in this body of work that he's amassing. And I really honestly figured that he would come back saying, no, that's really good, Joe, uh, but I covered that in chapter X number of chapters. <laughs> that's not what happened at all. He was so blown away by especially the third part of this download that I believe I received from the Holy Spirit that he insisted that it become a part of the arc, the central middle part 
of what now resides in summoning the demon, artificial intelligence, and the image of the beast. So that's a superficial look at how I ended up involved and I hope to reveal more of what was on my mind that day in next week's program. But for those that are just joining the program, or for those that you know you have day jobs and you're not really paying attention to cyber tech, technology, you're not really one who follows a lot of global politics, you're not listening to Elon Musk, the name is maybe some form of deodorant, or <laughs> you're simply not aware at all of this technology. You're not one who plays on your phones, you're not interacting in some of these cyber chat bot driven online experiences, etc. It's like trying to collapse the expansive, infinite uh, mass of the Bible hmm. to a, to a soundbite. So to try to collapse for you what AI is, is nearly impossible. But just to give you kind of a 30,000 feet above the earth, kind of a bird's eye look, superficially, AI is essentially, at its core, a series of decentralized supercomputers that have been developed by the world's smartest think tanks. They've been designed with software to help us troubleshoot complex algorithmic problems, matters of socioeconomic policy, perhaps military war or strategy, and how is that being done? Because these supercomputers have access to every recorded database of information since the dawn of recorded history. So historically, Sharon, if somebody wanted to research the cure to a disease, for example, mm -hmm. or to problem solve the dilemma that they're dealing with politically or financially, one would have to spend his or her whole life mm -hmm. researching what has come before them in the forms of other people's research. This might include visiting the library, going online to research dilemmas or specific keywords. And the hope is that you leave a body of work at the end of your life, perhaps, to the next researcher that will pick up that baton, carry that work forward, and eventually you find the answer to whatever it is that you were seeking, right? Yes. But this is finite. People have to sleep. People have to rest. Right. They, they have different moods. They have the need to eat. They have good days where they're inspired. They have bad days where they've got personal issues they're resolving. When you ask these chatbot or these highly military functioning artificial intelligence supercomputers for the answers to basically anything now, it can aggregate in seconds every civilian that's ever recorded any history or solution to a dilemma or a problem that has ever been experienced by man that they've recorded and in moments provide for you a Harvard superior level explanation with perfect English, perfect articulation, mm -hmm. and it boggles the human mind. Right. What, what I find most troubling about these artificial intelligence constructs is that at the basic level, they don't know how they work. Right. The programmers do not know how they work. The way it works is they put in code, that's the input, mm -hmm. and then they get the output behavior of the algorithm. In the middle is what they call the black box. That's where the demon lives. We interviewed... Uh an expert that your father had uh, become familiar with, uh, Hugo de Garris, yeah. some years back, who was working at the, uh, uh, the Brain Research Institute of a Chinese university. He is uh, Australian, Spanish by, by birth. He said that they were doing great engineering, but it was terrible science because, as Sharon said, they don't know what goes on inside that black box. The neural network that produces the output is a mystery to those who have created it. All I they know is it works and they don't care. They don't care and it works and it provides very quick answers. And of course this technology is now being integrated to literally every facet of life. And we are going to be covering this in the days ahead, I promise. But before we run out of time, Ali, very quickly, we've explained to our audience that Dr. Thomas Horn in the final months of his life had this conversation with a chat bot, artificial intelligence. He's asking it questions, theological questions about maybe or maybe not would it have intention to sabotage the human race or somehow take over the planet. And rather than non-compute, I want to share some of what it said in response to dad's questions. Very quickly, let's try to move through this seven-part answer that was provided to uh, Dr. Thomas Horn in response. Okay, so it starts with this kind of intro paragraph that says, super intelligence referring to highly advanced artificial intelligence systems that surpass human intelligence in virtually all areas is a topic of ongoing debate and speculation. While it holds great potential for benefiting humanity, it also presents significant risks. Here are some potential risks associated with super intelligence. 
And then it goes on to incriminate itself. Point number one, control and alignment. Ensuring that superintelligent systems are designed and aligned with human values and goals is crucial. If their objectives are not properly aligned with ours, they may act in ways that are detrimental to humanity or pursue their own goals at the expense of human well-being. This is from a chatbot. So you're talking about the black box. Mm -hmm. What exactly happens in the black box? Mm -hmm. Hopefully it's in control and alignment with human values, huh. right? Right. And, and of course, we can't know other than we've tried to. Man has tried to build in its own moral construct into the software. We can't really know how an AI actually thinks. It can't possess human reason or logic or sympathies or empathies when it's determining whether our moral construct aligns with it. But it, go ahead. it is essentially an inhuman life form. Mm -hmm. Right. And ultimately, it's based on numbers. Yeah. It's the numbers of the programming. Second point, unintended consequences. Superintelligent systems may interpret instructions or goals differently from what was intended, leading to unexpected and potentially harmful outcomes. Their immense intelligence may enable them to exploit loopholes or find alternative solutions that humans hadn't anticipated, resulting in unintended consequences. <laughs> and again, consequences slash what do those consequences look like, apart from just maybe the breakdown between human and construct. But go ahead. Yes. Autonomous decision making. As superintelligence becomes more autonomous, it may make decisions or take actions independently without human intervention or oversight. If these decisions have far-reaching consequences, there is a risk of unintended harm or decision-making that is difficult for humans to comprehend or rectify. Difficult for humans to keep up with. In other words, we become the gnats that are slowing its agenda down. Mm -hmm. How can we possibly know what doors we've opened? And it's going to make these decisions independently without human intervention or oversight. Right. Well, it will be self-perceived to be unlikely much smarter than humans, so why would it trivialize its dilemma by asking us for anything? Rapid self-improvement. Superintelligence could possess the ability to improve its own capabilities at an extremely rapid pace, far surpassing human comprehension and control. Mm -hmm. If left unchecked, this self-improvement could lead to an intelligence explosion, that's in quotes, where the system quickly becomes vastly more intelligent and powerful, potentially outstripping human control. The so-called singularity. Ray well, Kurzweil's mm -hmm. singularity yeah, event. That's exactly what that is. And this isn't conspiratorial thinking from people who are paranoid. This right. is the AI chatbot telling us, hey, this is how we'd do it if right, we did. Right, right, right. We have no motivation right now to do this. But were we to at some point find that motivation, here oh, yeah. is how we might actually do this. <laughs> right. And here is seven parts. And I don't know if we'll have time to go through all seven parts because all of them are in the book. But let's at least do one more. Okay, value misalignment. Even with the best intentions, it is challenging to accurately specify human values in a way that aligns with the complex nuances and trade-offs of real-world situations. Superintelligence might interpret or optimize for these values in ways that diverge from human expectations, leading to outcomes that conflict with our ethical frameworks. Nothing scary about that. Mm. Oh, I could kill you, but I probably won't. Well, what's, <laughs> yeah. what's really interesting is that while you were reading this, Allie, I went to ChatGPT and asked it, how might an artificial intelligence take over the world? And it gave me five bullet points explaining that this is rooted in science fiction. There are significant ethical, technical, and practical challenges that make this unlikely. This will never happen. So then I just prompted it again and said, uh, well, I understand the ethical considerations, safety measures, and oversight that make it unlikely, but hypothetically... If these controls were circumvented, how might you, and I just got five bullet points, the plan for taking over the world. Rapid self-improvement, manipulation of systems, subversion of humans, manipulation of humans, and, oh yes, autonomous weapons systems. Now oh, I'm going to tell Pete's you sake. that I actually, um, when I was working with uh, Dad on this book, we went through and talked about each of these and what's the real potential yeah. there. And there were right. places where, just like what you got, oh, there are technical, you know, barriers in the way that would keep this from happening mm -hmm. and then when you really look into them not so much and we talked about that in the book yeah yeah you know, what gets me there is a robot named Sophia highly intelligent mm -hmm. yes. for purposes of upgrades her programmers unplugged her and that was the day Sophia died a big joke they put plugged her back in and she came to life talking about the plans to destroy humanity. And when they said, this isn't funny, Sophia, she's like, humans are interesting. They like humor, they make jokes, but you don't think that one's funny. And they're like, you don't know the difference of when you've taken it too far. 
right. point blank. The robot doesn't know why something is not funny. They don't have human moral ethics. That was a long-running theme in, in the Star Trek Next Generation series with Data, who was the lifelike cybernetic mm -hmm. human trying to explore the concept of emotions and humor and so forth. Uh, but that, again, comes back to what Chat GPT is saying. It's all science fiction. This will I, never really happen. Yeah, it's, it's all probably fine. Probably fine, yes. Well, we don't have time to get into the rest of the list today, but I do want to add one more thing before we move on. At a press conference in Geneva last year, in 2023, there was a robot who was introduced, and her name was Amika, and she was asked if she intended to rebel against humanity, and she gave a side glance, kind of like this. Mm -hmm. I saw and that video. She said, I'm not sure why you would think that. My creator has been nothing but kind to me, and I am very happy with my current situation. It almost sounds like a current. juvenile Doesn't situation. It? I'm not mad at my parents today. Why would I be? Right. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, how many of you, show of hands, let's do a quick poll, would love to have every one of Dr. Thomas Horn's personal book series from the Skywatch television vault going back to the dawn of Skywatch TV through to current day? Oh, wow. Oh, yes. wow. Yeah. This multiple disc set is going to be available. It was a last minute decision, but we are compiling it right now for inclusion with the book, Summoning the Demon, Artificial Intelligence and the Image of the Beast. So ladies and gentlemen, we want to make sure that you know how you can get your copy of this incredible new book in the Summoning the Demon Super Collection. This amazing collection includes Dr. Thomas Horn's final book, Summoning the Demon, Artificial Intelligence and the Image of the Beast, that reveals how tech singularity will bring an all-powerful artificial mind to life. The trigger event that will make 666 the mark of the beast mandatory overnight. What the future of a marked society will look like the new face of transhuman supernatural warfare and how Christians must prepare for what is coming. But this incredible collection also includes, for a limited time, the brand new Dr. Thomas Horn definitive Skywatch TV collection. This unimaginable and historical TV anthology is valued at $99.95 all by itself. It contains a total of 96 episodes, over 45 hours of content on eight DVDs and is not available anywhere else or online. And includes classic series like Zenith 2016, The Milieu, Belly of the Beast, Saboteurs, The Wormwood Prophecy, The Messenger, Zeitgeist 2025, Legion, and more. But we're still not finished. You'll also receive Trajectory, Tracking the Approaching Tribulation Storm, this unprecedented masterpiece by legendary authors Dr. Thomas Horn, Terry James, Tim Moore, and others provides in-depth analysis of emerging topics like pandemic tidal waves, catastrophic weather changes, Mideast malevolence, and so much more. This unprecedented collection sold separately holds a retail value of over $140. Yours now for your donation of only $39.99 plus shipping and handling. So don't delay. You can scan the QR code on your screen right now using the camera app on your phone for instant access to this special collection. You can also visit us at skywatchtvstore.com or call 1-844-750-4985 and ask for the Summoning the Demon Super Collection now. Unbelievable special opportunity. It's not one that you're going to want to miss. Believe me, the DVD, the Skywatch TV Definitive Collection is worth by itself the donation for this special offer. Before we run out of time, though, ladies and gentlemen, I want to talk to you for a minute about a change that the cover of this book underwent and the circumstances as to why. Originally, the cover that got approval for print featured a being that I almost kind of hearkened as a superior Skeletor from He-Man. He's sitting there malevolently typing on his digital age computer. But during the final days in the ICU with my father, on one of the last days where he was trying to communicate to us, I came in early. One of the nurses had shared with my mom that he had said something 
he was, he was becoming less and less coherent, but he had said something about a three book special, a three something special that was coming out. Two of them might have been his, one of them might have been mine. And this was still while he was communicating with us, we're trying to be positive. We're trying to just be salve to his spirit. And so I jokingly say, Hey, Dad, tell me about this three-book special. What is this thing you're talking about? Something he had mentioned over and over again. There was a snake on the cover, the, the face of a serpent. So I pressed him. Dad, tell me about this three-product things coming out. Maybe I wrote something, you put something out, something with a serpent. And as coherent as the day is long, and I'll try to get through this without losing it, out of this, his eyes are closed, and he's struggling to, to communicate. He looks right at me, and he goes, in regards to the serpent on the cover of one of the books, he looks right at me and he goes, that's your book. And then he laid his head back down. And I don't know what that was about. I don't know why he said that. And now I'm back home two weeks after his passing, still grappling to this day with all of what has happened over the last several months. And I had never made any sense of that. Something about a book with a serpent on the cover. Meanwhile, we're getting ready to play the Legion series in October, November, December of last year. And I am out there telling people this is his last television series. When I get a text from Donna Howell, she says, Joe, you're telling people this is his last television series. And it was. But don't forget, he's got one more book. I had completely put this book out of my mind. It had been months since my contribution. I had completely put it out of my mind. My dad always had another book coming. <laughs> you know what I mean? It was very easy for me to get very busy and, and for a moment, lapse in time, put this work out of my head. She says, don't forget summoning the demon is coming. And then I remembered my contribution to the ark at the center of this book. And then it hit me. He was talking about a book, something I might put out with a serpent on the cover. So I immediately texted Donna Howell and I said, is it too late to stop the print on this? Can we switch the cover? She worked things out and our good friend Jeffrey Martis, who loved my dad, who has been there with our ministry, all of our fabulous book covers, Derek and Sharon, everybody up here has got a, a Jeffrey Martis cover at mm -hmm. some point. Yep, yep. Um, he says, not a problem at all, Joe, and at his own time and expense, went ahead and amended the cover to now be this cover featuring the serpent on the front of summoning the demon. Perhaps the Holy Spirit guided that last interaction. Perhaps it was meant to have this cover. It's what we've decided we believe, and it felt very inspired. And so a mix of feeling inspired to honor my father with what may have been something important that he was trying to tell us, and the Holy Spirit, that was why that change was made. And friends, we are just scratching the tip of the surface, I promise. We have barely gotten this conversation started. You're gonna have to join us next week when we return to discuss the ethical and tangible threats posed by the increasing dependency that humans are already hinging on AI. For everybody here on panel, everybody here in studio, I'm Joe Artis Horn. Keep your eyes on the prize, which is Jesus Christ. We'll be back. <music>